Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jose Parduino. I work in the Division of uh, Water Sciences in the science sector in UNESCO. You already met uh, Blanca, who is the director of the Division of Water Sciences. Um, my task is also to coordinate the uh, part of the water family, so the, the water centers and the water chairs. And I also, I am also moderator of this session, so the first working meeting, which uh, title is Increased Cooperation Among Similarly Themed and Original Water Chairs and Water Centers and Information Sharing Platform. We will have, apart my brief introduction, a presentation from uh, two projects, one from uh, Professor Luis Cicero from a chair in uh, Paro, Portugal, the second one from uh, Professor Parr, who's from the uh, a chair in the US in Cincinnati, and uh, also a presentation from Professor Chiara Biscarini on the platform that uh, the, the Perugia chair would like to propose to um, share with all the other um, water chairs. So um, I will start with my brief presentation uh, and the aims of this meeting. We had the uh, opening this morning. We also had a very nice uh, keynote speech from uh, uh, Dr. Bonora on the, on the concept of new humanism. Now we're starting with the, uh, with the meeting itself of the uh, water chairs, which aims are to discuss and identify contribution to the chairs to the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As you know, UNESCO is part of the UN agencies are subjected to implement the new uh, agenda, which will uh, last uh, for the next 15 years, which is uh, replacing the Millennium Development Goals, which uh, came to an end in 2015. So we are much uh, committed to it, and all our activities needs to also to be uh, following and implementing the uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Second aim is to identify how chairs can increase their contribution to the implementation of IHP, so the International Hydrological Program, being chairs part of the IHP, for this biennium 2016-2017, and also for the entire uh, eighth phase of IHP, which was, was already presented this morning by Blanca. And also the third aim would be to define mechanism to increase cooperation between regional similar think chairs and initiating the establishment of an information sharing system among all water chairs. And also, as you know, to discuss that will be on Wednesday next on a, on a round table on new humanism for the 21st century. So you heard about the UNESCO water family, Blanca explained uh, thoroughly this morning and uh, UNESCO Water Family promotes international scientific cooperation in water research, uh, in integrated water resource management, the preservation of uh, planet's water resources, and uh, in, for universal access to water services worldwide, education and capacity building, and also culture and disaster, among, among others. So as you know, we have 42 chairs, two very new, one from Kazakhstan and the other one from the UK, which we don't have contact yet, but they will be, as Blanca explained, when, when an application is sent to UNESCO for a, for a chair, it's sent to the Department of Higher Education, it belongs to science, comes to the science sector, and it belongs to water, comes to the Division of Water Sciences. So we don't have a, a real, uh, um, direct contact in, in the process. So um, why it's different for the category two centers, we, we have uh, currently 36, and also in the family we have one category one center, which is the UNESCO IHE in, in the Water Edu Institute of Water Education in the Netherlands, and also the WAP, the World Water Assessment Program, we have the coordinator this morning and in the opening. What I would like to add is that uh, uh, in the science sector there are three divisions. One is the division of water sciences, which is led by uh, Blanca. Then we have two other div divisions. One is ecology and earth sciences. And the third one is uh, uh, policy and capacity building. In total, the science sector has 202 chairs. So water has 42, but the total of the science sector to who we belong are 202. 
And I also would like to inform you that the science sector is organizing the first meeting ever of the science sector chairs that will be held next July in Geneva. So we will have a lot of participation from all the division uh, chairs in, in, in the science sector and you will be uh, invited to participate. It should be from 5 to 7 July next year, but you will receive further and more detailed communication. So why the contribution to the UN 2030 agenda and the SDG? If you know, the, this agenda comprised 17 goals and uh, it's much more detailed than, than the uh, Millennium Development Goals which were very diluted in, in, in all the actions. Those are very well defined 17 goals, uh, number six of which, which is, I don't have a pointer, but this one here is on water and sanitation, which is at the core uh, of, of uh, the Sustainable Development Goal for Fresh Water. So the title of this uh, Goal 6 is Ensuring Availability and Sustainable Management of Water and Sanitation for All. I would like just very briefly to go through because every target, so uh, every goal, so 17 goals, are composed by a certain number of targets. In total, there are over 169. Water has uh, eight targets, 6.1 to 6.6 plus 6A and 6B. But not only, but it's more complicated than that because every single target has between one and two indicators, which in fact are what, what a country should measure in the field. So uh, very briefly, we have uh, 6.1 and 6.2, which reflects the, um, what, what WHO and UNICEF are, are doing in the uh, joint monitoring program on water sanitation, so access to clean water. 6.3 is a new one, it's on, on reducing pollution, so eliminating dumping and minimizing release of hazardous chemicals and materials, so water waste, wastewater. 6.4 is uh, water use efficiencies ac across all sectors to ensure sustainable withdrawal and supply of fresh water to address water scarcity. 6.5 is integrated water resource management at all levels, including through transboundary cooperation, be it in, in concerning uh, transboundary surface water, but also uh, transboundary aquifers, so groundwater. And 6.6 .6 is uh, water-related ecosystems, including mountains, forests, wetlands, river, aquifer lakes. And then 6.8, which we're adding later on, international cooperation. 6.B, participation of local communities. But there are other water-related SDGs addressed by IHP, so by water. For, for example, is number four is quality education, which aims to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. And water education and capacity building beyond the teaching of hydrological sciences need to be multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. For example, the role of chairs and center, also the discussion we had this morning on the new humanism and not to see uh, uh, science in tanks, but in an interdisciplinary way. And, uh, and other related SDG, eight, decent work and economic growth. And uh, I will not go uh, through this in details also because all this presentation will be available on the Perugia Chair uh, website. Another one which is also quite important is uh, goal uh, 11, and in particular the target 11.5, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. If you think to disaster, be it floods or uh, landslides or drought which are affecting our settlements, cities and also urban settlements. So um, water related disasters and uh, uh, the aim to protect poor and people in a situation which are very vulnerable. So um, this is very important to us. We, we will also circulate a, a sort of a questionnaire with which we would require the, the, the chair who are present here today maybe to tick some of the goals and the targets they would like to uh, um, be acted in. Now, uh, about the IHP, we have attempted to, uh, to make a um, distribution of the chair topics 
in, in between the six themes of uh, the IHP that Blanca explained uh, uh, substantially this morning. So we would also like to understand uh, your contribution to this phase of the IHP, which, lasts, which will last until 2021. So we have many years to come. And to this, we have handed to you uh, a, a complete chair list of chairs. And uh, in yellow, it should be highlighted the chair that, that should be present today. But uh, we already know that there are a couple of who did not come yet. You also have a focal point, which are colleagues. So in Paris, we are coordinating of the, of the water family in a way. But you have a focal point and an alternate which is the person in the field or in headquarters that will take care of uh, uh, all your requests and uh, with who you will have a, a strict contact. We will provide a list of names which are here, but also the email address. Uh, with this, you were also given the six themes of the IHP that you have in the slides, but also with other two cross-cutting themes, water and gender and water culture, which are cross-cutting in the six themes, but with, which not appear as a theme itself in the IHP structure. So, um, sorry again, but I will pass over to you also a list with the name of the chairs and with the themes. We would like also to have a confirmation that the subdivision of chairs to a theme is the correct one, but by doing so, if you can tick where your chair can contribute more to the IHP team will really help us. And uh, with this, okay, this is to explain uh, uh, and to have a map uh, after that you will give us your input will be uh, better done. Now, there is another thing that we're trying to intervene. You're asked to uh, present a report every two years, not to us, but to the uh, uh, Department of Higher Education, and uh, this, this report is then subjected to an evaluation that is done by, uh, in this case, by the Secretariat of IHP, and in particular, it will be done by your focal point. And, uh, but we would like also to, uh, in, you to include some more information in, uh, in this uh, report that uh, is, is is uh, designed by the, uh, by the education sector and not by us. So by adding, for example, you have already to respond on major outcomes, results, and impact of the chair, including impact on possibly national policies. But we would like to know, for example, if the number of people you trained in a sex, sex disaggregated data, for example, how many people, how many women were trained or how many, how many men were trained, and by countries, which are also very important for us to report on. The other one is uh, on partnership and exchanges with other institutions and UNESCO chairs, which are crucial, because also during the proposal, when you, when you provide a proposal to uh, become a UNESCO chair, you also have to, to indicate partnership with, our, with other entities, not forcefully uh, uh, within the UNESCO family, but uh, other, and to see how you evolve in your, in your endeavor with, uh, with these partners. And then, um, of course, how, how your chair is contributing to the IHP teams and objectives, and also future developments and eventual uh, difficulties. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, human and financial resources of your chair should, should also be addressed clearly. We have chairs which, which are in, in very difficult situation. Uh, be it for financial situation or because of uh, an, an unrest situation in their country. There are many countries in, in, uh, in, in war at the moment and many chairs which are in countries which are at war which cannot operate. So this is also important for us to know. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I will also, uh, one by one, we can discuss because you're not many here, we, we were, we, I think we have 15 chairs minus two, 13. And uh, so I will, I will come to, to see you one by one during the coffee break, we can discu discuss about this. And um, thank you. Finito, finito. <laughs> no, but because I'm the moderator, I, I continue. So I would like now to present uh, uh, Professor Luis Cicero and uh, Professor Parr, who will also um, talk about two projects that uh, 
are very important and that uh, include different chairs and, 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 and centers, so including the water family. So I will now leave the floor to Luis. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Luis Shisher. I'm, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here with my, my cousin, <laughs> Giuseppe Arduino. So I'll be talking about uh, a proposal that we developed at the University of Algarve. Uh, and our aim was to link uh, the UNESCO centers and UNESCO chairs in creating a, a European Union master course. So this uh, idea came from uh, a previous master course that we had in, in the Algarve. It was uh, a master course in equidrology, and uh, it, it ran from 2010 until 2016. So we are in the final year now in the project of the project, and uh, it uh, it was a project that involved. It, it is, I don't know, don't worry, no, I think it is from here. It was a project that involved three uni main universities from Algarve, uh, Uch in Poland, and also the Center, uh, Ecological Center in, in Poland, and the University in Kiel, and then we had other associated partners. So this, it was a project that is funded by European Union, so the students got, got uh, um, some scholarships, uh, all fees were covered, and uh, so this is the, the the track that we have here, so students start by the University of Algarve in Poland, they, they move to, a, a, to a, a summer course in Brazil, then they moved back to, to Europe, to, to uh, Poland or to Germany, and then they choose uh, whatever university they want to do the, the, the master thesis. So during this process, we, um, we had more than one, I don't want, probably 1,000 candidates from almost 80 countries. And uh, we know in, in the end, uh, it was a very successful um, program. So based on that, and this uh, end came to an end, of course, it was a five-year project, we decided to continue this idea of um, creating something related with, with water that is international. Then we had this, um, uh, now we have the SDGs, and we have the IHP phase eight, and so we have all these topics uh, related with water, and um, so the idea was to create something, because we, we, we realized during the, the, the project that uh, the students that want to apply to, to the master were students with very different um, backgrounds. So we had people from engineering, from biology, from ecology, from social sciences. So we started to understand that, of course, and to, real, to, to realize that uh, what we really can bring all these topics together. So the idea was to create something that able to glue this, this, this uh, these people and this, this interest. So we have all these uh, topics around these SDGs and IHP goals now, and so the idea was to, to bring them together in creating a, a master course. So where can we find uh, very good expertise already existing and uh, very uh, uh, recognized uh, quality of expertise? So we had UNESCO, UNESCO chairs and UNESCO centers. So the idea was to really to bring them these people together. So we used let's say, the, the IHP facility. So we contacted uh, Giuseppe Arduino and I will need to HP. So you received, uh, yes, last year, uh, uh, a letter from him uh, about this project. So we, has, we had this contact uh, to the UNESCO chairs and UNESCO centers uh, all over the world. We also contacted other partner universities and other um, private sectors and other, other partners. And we got the feedback, and based on this feedback, we created a consortium that uh, includes full partners and associated partners. Uh, this is a, a, a list of the of the partners that we have now. It's not it's not readable, <laughs> but it's just to to, to show the the, the, the the number. So we have like 27 partners uh, from UNESCO centers and UNESCO chairs. Uh, I, I can't tell, but it was 20 something. So, uh, so you can see that we covered uh, all the regions here. So we have people from all the regions, and many of you uh, are are, are in, in this in this proposal already. You are here. You are there. Yeah. 
So the, for, for this uh, master course structure, the idea was to have a, a course that is based in which university, in Lubeck University in Algarve. So we are the full, the full partners, members. And this will be a course that will be um, uh, organized with very uh, few mandatory courses. It basically will, will have uh, optional courses. So students may, may um, choose their own path. And these optional courses will be provided by UNESCO chairs, UNESCO centers. Could be online, could be physically present when possible, but this will be so. The idea is that we have so, so many, such a multitude, multitude of, of topics that students can really choose whatever. So diplomacy or ecology or governance or management or sanitation. So they can choose and they have the best people giving them the, 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 the information. So this is uh, the, let's say, the, the structure of the course in terms of the thematic areas and, and of the semester. So it's a four semester course. And we have the, the participation of the chairs and, and centers in the short courses, uh, guest lectures that sometimes we even do it uh, online, like video conferencing, co uh, supervision of practical uh, work on the thesis. So we, we arrange a way of not being to not need to travel across the Atlantic or another oceans to be together, but we can do it uh, even uh, online. So this is just for you to see the uh, 28 optional courses that we already had, and Adrian, you are here. I think it's the last one uh, in Cincinnati. So from, 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 from this group here already, we have you now Marco. So we have 28 optional courses. Right? So you can see that you know, the, the, the feedback from the colleagues was very, very interesting and, and so very open to, to have this kind of, uh, of, um, of collaborations. So, uh, in terms of the, 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 this project, is we are, we are preparing it now so for, for submission. And it's very, um, it's very um, let's see, good, it's very attractive for uh, students because students receive a full scholarship with 1,000 euros per month. They got insurance, they got tra as you know, travel funds, installation funds, and all the university fees are covered. So they don't spend any money since they, they, they left their home whenever country they are until they, they return. Uh, for consortium uh, full partners, they, 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 they receive the fees from, from European Union that are uh, fully paid, and also coordination funds. And for part of the universities that are not the three in, in the core, they receive funds for scholars, for, to, for, to exchange colleagues and to visit uh, visiting professors. They receive funds for activities, uh, and they receive students for uh, supervision and, and, and this kind of activities. So I think it's a win-win situation for, uh, for, uh, for everybody. So in terms of the preparation that is well written, but we are preparing all the new, 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 new proposal that is uh, submitted next year in, in February. Uh, I will be sending uh, until 2nd of November an email asking for the confirmation of your uh, willingness to participate in this uh, endeavor. Then by 15 November, I will send you the documents from the European Union so that we can uh, make this basis. And the 15th December, uh, I asked the reception of inputs from, from you, from partners. So we have already a draft document, so you can, you can work on it. And also the reception of the commitment letters. Then by 10 January, circulation of the first version of the document, which is not the first, but it's like an improved first one. Then the reception of comments, then circulation of the second version. And by uh, 20 of February, to have it, uh, to have it finalized. So this is uh, what we are trying to do today, to do something that brings all the colleagues uh, together, that of course are willing to, uh, to do that, and to create a, a, a international master course dealing with water in the various aspects uh, related with water. And uh, I think it's probably unique uh, around the world that we have some such kind of, of, um, of integration and of uh, multi topic approach to water. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much for the attention. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. I think we can finish with the presentation and then uh, we can have maybe some question and remarks session. So, I don't know. We have another system. All right. Um, so, I'm going to be presenting today and tomorrow. So, tomorrow I'll, I'll present more on um, my, my research. What I wanted to share with you today 
was a, a proposal that we've recently submitted to the MacArthur Foundation for a 100 million uh, US dollar grant. Um, and if we're successful with that, that would be um, amazing. And I want to thank Giuseppe for his hard work in uh, being involved in that as well, um, bringing UNESCO on board with that grant proposal. Um, come what may, even if uh, the grant is not successful, we've now done all the hard work bringing the partners together, which uh, provides us with the structure of a grant. Anyone who's written grants knows that an, an incredible amount of work goes into writing this kind of document for a grant of that scale. Um, and we'll be using it to approach the, the Gates Foundation and other organisations like that. So what I'm going to share with you today is basically the, the thinking behind the grant um, and the actual project itself. Um, so I'm a UNESCO Water Chair of Water Access and Sustainability. I'm also the director of the Taft Research Center, which is a humanities research center, an interdisciplinary research center at the University of Cincinnati, and full professor of political science and uh, architectural theory. I've, I've a, I'm a bit of an anomaly in the university. I am one of those transdisciplinary scholars. Um, some of them call me sort of intellectually nomadic. I'm fine with that title. I move between the disciplines and I've always done that and I enjoy doing that. I'm also a distinguished fellow at the Global Center for Advanced Studies. So a variety of different appointments uh, tapping into sort of different interests. And I work very closely with my co-chair, Professor Dion Dionysus, who's a chemical engineer. Uh, some of you might know him from the IHP. Uh, he's also at the University of Cincinnati and he does a lot of work on water purification. And the, the conceptualization of us as two chairs together um, has been an interesting one uh, because basically the sort of work that I do is interested in how do we make the technological solutions that often engineers come up with in the lab, which are working perfectly in the lab, then we bring them out into the world and all of a sudden they don't work. And they don't work because people reject them for whatever reason, okay? Um, and so that's, as Bianca, Blanca was talking about today, collaborating with the social sciences starts to become very important. So I've spent five years uh, working in various slums around the world. Uh, I've been to the slums in M Mumbai, the Darabi slum, um, and I've spent a lot of time in the Kibera and Dagareti slums in Nairobi, uh, interviewing women and observing women, how they use water, how they collect it, how much they pay for it, and what's the percentage of uh, that vis-a-vis -vis their household income. I can talk about that a little bit tomorrow. This is just the background for the project that I wanted to share with you today. Um, so here are some of the solutions that have come up. One of them is with Ormandi Trust in the Nairobi slum. And it's a, it's a successful engineering solution. Um, it can, and what I mean by that is it does its job. It provides water and sanitation services. And what happens is the waste, the human waste, gets turned into biogas which is then sold back to the slum dwellers uh, as a form of um, energy, right? And they've been set up all throughout the slums. There's over 50 of them now just in Kibera alone. So they, they go up very quickly. But they're having a problem. People don't like using them. They're smelly, they're dark, women feel unsafe inside of them. Um, there's the cost associated with it. There's a whole gamut of issues. There's cultural issues around using the biogas. Um, so the point here is although they can be replicated and in theory they can work, there's this problem of cultural acceptance around it, okay? So then you have other kinds of designs which I would call culturally appropriate designs like Kunkui Design Initiative. They've been building water and sanitation facilities also in the slums. However, it's a much slower process, more sustainable, people have involvement in the building and design of these, but it could take a year to build one of these and it's only a few toilets. So they're beautifully designed, the community loves them, they work really well, but you can't replicate them quickly enough to keep up with slum growth and the number of people living there. Um, Human Needs Project has come in and built a very large facility using the same kind of community input model, um, but the very large facility doesn't service all the little neighbourhoods throughout the slums. So what it means is women have to travel maybe 45 minutes across the slum to get to the facility. So you can already see just there where the problem is when you're building at large scale. 
So my research has found that we need to come up with a solution that's replicable, can be repeated, like your mind we trust, but one that's flexible to account for cultural differences and one that's scalable so that it's small and it can be plugged in to the, because slums are made up like little rural villages, right? That can be plugged in to these, what we would call sort of um, uh, urban patterns in architecture um, and function within the micro patterning formation. So, reached out to Michael Zarekski, Associate Dean at the College of Design, Architecture, Art and Planning at the University of Cincinnati, because um, this was when the MacArthur Grant was being put forward and they wanted ideas. He's also the designer who built the Roche Health Centre in Tanzania. It's an off-the-grid medical centre and they're now building house, doctor's housing as well. Off-the-grid, meaning it has its own energy through solar. It collects water off the roof. Um, it's something that uh, uh, uses ISBB bricks, uh, using local mud and just a tiny bit of cement, so not a lot of water used to build it. Um, in the local community, the economy has been kind of um, uh, uh, stimulated as a result of this because it all uses all local labour and includes local training. So he's very attuned to these kinds of sustainable integrated solutions. Um, and shared with him the idea that perhaps what we need to do is come up with a concept where we combine that kind of work and also the work of like what Kui, Kui Design Initiative does with the high technology of, say, the solar decathlon house. The University of Cincinnati uh, was one of the few teams that made it to the mall uh, a few years ago where they had a, a display of uh, future designs for off-the-grid housing. And the system that the University of Cincinnati came up with um, was this zero energy house that collected and reused its water. And these tubes at the side are actually um, solar tubes that heat the water and it can produce it to sort of almost boiling point, which is amazing if you think about in the slums, one of the best ways to get rid of the germs in the water is to bring it to boiling point for three minutes. So I was thinking, how can we combine this idea and the technology of this with the tiny house? The tiny house is another thing that was built at the University of Cincinnati using crates. You know shipping containers? They're everywhere in the slums. People use them to, to live in, right? How can we put those two ideas together to come up with, and this is the tiny house on site, and come up with something that's replicable but flexible, okay? So that when it comes in, it's got all the infrastructure needed for clean energy and water, but the local community that's going to use it can retrofit it according to their needs and, and so on and so forth, right? So produce this model between two things. So it's replicable plus it's flexible, okay? So I'm going to share with you the idea of the housing H2O prototype that we've just developed. Ooh. We had to produce the film for the Macau. Hello, we are the UNESCO co-chairs of Water Access and Sustainability. I am a professor of cultural criticism and environmental theory at the University of Cincinnati. I assess and evaluate socially inclusive and culturally appropriate solutions to water and sanitation in low-income countries. I am a professor of chemical and environmental engineering at the University of Cincinnati. I create technologies for water treatment and quality. For the past five years, I've been documenting and evaluating water and sanitation services in the slums of Nairobi. One of the greatest challenges of slum urbanization is water. An H2O prototype. That will be scalable and repeatable. It will function as a water collection, treatment and storage device, and its structure will be flexible, accommodating different needs and contexts. Five billion cubic meters of clean water across three cities, over five years, serving one million people, costing $100 million. In collaboration with 
collaboration with the MacArthur Foundation. And our international network of non-profit organizations and development agencies currently working in the slums. So thank you, UNESCO, for coming on board with that. Um, and if anyone wants any more information about that, please feel free to either contact um, Michael Zaretsky, the Associate Dean at the University of Cincinnati, or Dion, or you can contact myself. Thanks very much for listening. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Chiara Biscaridi, and uh, I work here at the University for Foreigners in Perugia at the UNESCO Chair in Water Resource Management and Culture. And uh, thank you for being here. And uh, after this one, your wonderful project, mine is a little project made by myself and my students, and uh, um, I'm going to present. Uh, this little project that uh, the title is Connected and Shared Science. Uh, and uh, the case study is uh, um, UNESCO Water Chair Case Study. And uh, here are my PhD student, Maria Giovanna Pagnot, and also, where is it? <laughs> and also Mirko, our uh, web developers, and uh, other students. And the first uh, uh, object was uh, to understand how uh, the scientific information spread out uh, in the scientific community and uh, the transformation of information to knowledge. And uh, with the collaboration of uh, uh, a thematic platform that uh, carried out projects that could not be done within a single uh, research. And uh, uh, the second object, which is the core of uh, the project, uh, is centering, exploring how communication can improve outcome, outcomes from science and uh, society. It's well known that uh, in order to ensure an exchange between scientific experts and uh, governmental institutions and the general public, uh, scientists must be able to communicate with the different audiences. And uh, the main goals uh, uh, of our work is to improve and extend science uh, communication. And this work is uh, with students, not technical students, uh, students of uh, uh, um, international communication. And I work with them, uh, I'm an engineer, and uh, I like to share my uh, my knowledge with, uh, with them, and also explore the approaches to science communication, investigate how public audiences receive and use scientific information. Um, and also we, we try to assess the impact of the effectiveness community engagement to, uh, on the relationship between uh, scientists and general public. And uh, also uh, how can we translate into policy recommendation and concrete uh, actions? And uh, uh, the basic assumption uh, of uh, the, this communication model is that there is a linear progression from public education to public understanding. And uh, that this uh, progression uh, cultivated publicly enthusiastic about uh, science. And uh, is uh, important to note that science communication is about uh, scientists and public, and uh, connected not scientists in two ways with, uh, uh, with the public and everyday life of the people. And uh, I <laughs> would like uh, also to show in this slide uh, the results uh, obtained by my students uh, of uh, my um, two courses. Uh, one is uh, um, communication and management of natural disaster and uh, uh, GIS, uh, um, geographical information <laughs> systems. And uh, um, two years ago, we had uh, the World Lake Conference in Perugia, and uh, we developed uh, um, film, many movies about lakes. And uh, there was an award, the name was Lake Doctor, like a wine and uh, this was uh, the team of students. 
then um, we, uh, we try to uh, translate the scientific uh, uh, language in uh, divulgative language also for children, like uh, this work uh, for uh, understanding tsunami for children, and also uh, uh, the language of nature, like elephants uh, in um, the case study of Sri Lanka, that they, they can hear and uh, understand uh, the arrival of a tsunami before a human. And uh, also, we have uh, um, science TV, science for TV, where we can uh, uh, publish our videos and uh, also some uh, tables, video tables. The first one is uh, about the case studies of earthquake of L'Aquila, and the last one is about uh, um, connecting and shared science, the case studies of uh, UNESCO Water Chair. And we investigate the type of communication of all the chairs. Uh, the website, the account, the project, and they are very uh, different and uh, also in type, uh, in um, content, but also in uh, communication to the public. And uh, we try to understand what's the, the, the best way to uh, um, construct our website. And uh, we, this is our website, but we have also a section, the name is We Talk, and uh, it's for the public. We try to translate the scientific uh, results, our scientific paper, in uh, divulgative uh, information for the people, for the students, for everyday life. And uh, also, we have just a little prototype uh, of, uh, this is our website, a section, the, the name is Chairs Water Related, but just a little work, <laughs> not uh, very much for now, and uh, is uh, uh, like a platform where you can go in the chair program of HP or UNESCO, then you can enter, and there are different sections. The first one is PR, and uh, I can open, okay. And there are all the chairs and sites for per region with the website. And uh, we check every four, 20, no, 42 chairs and some statistics of per region and also uh, per country and uh, per year of established leader. We say that in the last decade of many chairs and the other sections are also the chairs for IH, the seven IH, IHP teams and the two cross country teams and uh, we map like with a tour all these uh, chairs and you can explore uh, where they are and here you can read all the information that we try to <laughs> summarize and uh, you, you have a different color of icons uh, in, for different IHP teams. And uh, you can go down and uh, look where the, the chair is and zoom inside the, the Google Earth. And the last section is, <laughs> is we do. <laughs> <laughs> the first time also for the professor. <laughs> and the last section is we do we, what we can do uh, together. And uh, uh, there is a password only, only for the, the chairs, and the, they can insert uh, the project uh, in the sharing platform. You can select your chair, your region, and your country, then uh, the title project. Uh, the principal investigator and uh, the research team, the other, we can add something or thinking uh, is it just a prototype, mere text, yeah? <laughs> and uh, some keywords, link, and the password. Then, for all the people can search very, very simply way. Search, search. <laughs> oh, 
okay. It's search is for everybody and only one field will be because it's very easy and you can choose of different fields search for chat, for auto, for keywords, for county, for region and then a field of the product that we upload. And the last section, the last section is we talk. And uh, we want to uh, insert in this section uh, everything is uh, that is interesting for <coughs> the, uh, the, the people, the public. And uh, for this reason, <laughs> we are waiting, uh, because the project is uh, going uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, 25 for an interview, just a short interview to Minus, my students will be there, and uh, then we insert all the short interviews inside our prototype platform. Thank you. Thank you very much to the presenter. So we had the uh, pre presentation, we had uh, two potential collaborative projects and then uh, we um, we have the platform which I think is a fantastic idea and, and it, it is really a great job Chiara and all your collaborators thank you so much because uh, when when we started talking about that uh, on, on, on Skype I said let me check with our, uh, our uh, um, administrative uh, section of, of UNESCO because, uh, no, I wanted to inform them because we have a platform which is UNESDOC that you are aware of. It's completely out of date. It's very difficult to use. So I, I think this is very, very simple and also very powerful. So I think that we, if, if uh, the chair in Perugia would like to continue in this endeavor, is much, much more than welcome from UNESCO. And uh, and uh, I talked to the to the people who are dealing with the UNESCO. They will link also to. Uh, so it's a great job. I think is uh, the way that we can go forward to have uh, uh, shared communication, but also because with communication we improve and we, we, we highlight the way we can work together. And I think it's a great uh, it's a great start. Uh, from that. So I would like to ask if the, uh, there are any questions, comments to the presentation. Yes. Comment to you all. It's uh, very frequently we receive requests at ISP to support uh, uh, projects or to support uh, uh, proposals. We recently have uh, support one proposal in, for Canada and they got 60 million of US dollar and that's great. So there is power, for, power behind that. But in many occasions, we don't know that you're doing proposals and that's why we just don't push or uh, promote your proposal. Keep us informed because we almost have a grant uh, a, a recommendation for a proposal to compete with the professor's part proposal. We didn't do, uh, do it because we received your the information of yours on time. But please keep us informed first. Secondly, please remember that we can provide letters to support the proposals if the UNESCO Water Family is involved. We can do lobbying for you, so keep us informed. And I think there is, these two are very excellent examples that we can work together. And now with this wonderful tool, thank you very much, Chiara. It's really, it was really a very good surprise. We can do a lot of things together. And we are here to help you. We are here to push uh, for your proposals to promote. And we believe that we can, we are in touch with a specific, uh, with the Gates Foundation. We are in touch with you and we have, uh, persons that are doing lobbying, but we only need to know what you, that you want to do something, okay? Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Yeah. My name is Mohamed Karamus. I'm presenting uh, Water Reuse Chair 
For a number of us, uh, we're just representing a chair. The chairs are not here, so we have to go back and pass some of the information from here to other people interested. The TED presentation was quite clear, how we can connect, how we can interact, and how could people communicate with the individual leader. Uh, my suggestion is in the other two proposals, if we could get some uh, information on Twitter and Link, or how to bring together the email, but if there is a site or an address that we could utilize and have people to communicate and hopefully to cooperate. Thank you. Thanks. Depending on where it goes, um, and then we'll have to go on to sort of other funding agencies. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably not at liberty to, to, to share the entire written proposal. But I'm certainly at liberty to be sharing the link and the concept and for you to reach out and perhaps become part of the proposal as it moves forward. Yeah. I would propose another thing, if you allow me, to respond to your question. Um, Luis said that by the 3rd of November, he would share through the IHP Secretariat, so he would reach all the chairs, the call for the, the project. And by 15 to consolidate of November and and uh, be part of the proposal. So you will receive an email concerning the proposal on go what, and we can do. It, I propose that we can do. It. If you wish, we can do the same thing with your project and 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 spread it over by the IHP secretariat uh, um, web, uh, not website uh, email, because we have all the chairs and centers emails, and so in a row we 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 we, we touch base with everybody. Yes, oh, of, of course, okay, yes, it, uh, because it, it, if your address is not in the address of the chair, yes, of course, yes, sure. Hmm. All the presentation will be, will be shared also in the, will be present in the, in the web platform, also, also in the web, in the, cha in the web chair. And also to remind you that we are live streaming, we are live streamed. And this is all recorded, and it will be available also in the in the um, in the Perugia Chair website. We need to use this. Ah, okay. If, if it's possible to in this in this area where we have the project that we can insert the project, that the people that are a part of the network receive an information that something was added. Because we are not going to, you know, people are not visiting sites um, daily. And if you are adding something, the, if it's possible to, to have the list of the, of the emails of the people that, you know, and then to send it immediately, you know, what, what happened to you. Like, you know, what, yeah, it is, yes, and be, it, because it could, could raise you know, some contact or people that read it. It's possible? Okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. So check so that people will realize that something is added and can, can see if they're interested in joining. Okay. Because it, we can look for cooperative projects, not only for, uh, for projects that are finished, but for instance, for ideas of projects. So if I have an idea for a project and put there, and, I, and, and the people that could be interested in, in joining this, this idea could, could, could also uh, participate. So maybe in this, in this aspect. Okay. Thank you. Going from no information, no technology to high technology <laughs> and sharing in a, in, a, in, a, in a very fast way. Other comments, questions? Yeah. A question for Professor Parr. And I'm really curious because collecting water from the roof is a very traditional way to provide water. So, would you please, Adrian, focus on the method that you would use and the, uh, the storage of the water is collective or individual? So the idea is to turn 
the structure of the dwelling and that dwelling can become a home, it could become an office, it could be, you can tell, I'm, I'm used to working with architects, so I use objects a lot. Um, it can be attached to other ones to make bigger dwellings, like the Human Needs Project, so it's not always built from the ground up, which makes it replicable. But the actual structure itself, to conceive of the structure of the dwelling as infrastructure. So at the moment, what we're doing is we can collect water off the roof, yes. There's an issue around um, uh, contamination, especially in the slums, which has a lot of fecal matter in the air if you're collecting it off the roof. So you have to think of a purification system for that water. Unlike, say, in rural Tanzania, where Michael builds the off-the-grid houses, you just have a, a ball system that allows the initial runoff to get thrown away, and then any more runoff from the rain then gets collected in the tank outside. That won't work so well in a slum-like condition because of the faecal matter and it gets so contaminated. So they don't introduce into those dwellings water that comes from the roof, no runoff, okay? So then the question becomes, well, if we can't do that because of that limitation, how can we turn the structure into the infrastructure that filtrates the water? So the Human Needs Project as a result of work that they've been doing with um, engineers in the United States, has a whole building, it's a huge building, right? And the whole back part of the building is filled with tanks that go through, you know, stones, pebbles, sand. That's the usual sand filtration system. It takes up a ginormous amount of space and it's a very cumbersome thing to replicate small so this concept is leaning on all of these ideas but creatively figuring out a way to turn the structure of the entire building into the filtration system so that the water comes in through one wall and that acts as the stone filtration, the water goes into another wall, acts as the pebble filtration through to the next wall which acts as the sand, a sand filtration system which by the time it gets to the final wall we try to figure out a way to store it in there and provide, you know, taps out. We're still yet trying to figure that out um, as a way to kind of uh, 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 clean the water as well as collect the water. So it's not just a problem of water collection. It's also a problem of water purification and then a problem of water storage, right? Um, so that's the goal of, of this idea. So it's it's combining some of these ideas with other ones, like the system that we developed for the solar decathlon house. That could potentially be the technology that's used to clean it as well. We're looking into that at the moment because those solar tubes can boil the water. But the question then becomes one in the slums, is boiling it going to be sufficient, right? But it all comes back to the simple idea of using the entire structure as an infrastructure. Yep. Thank you. Other comments, questions? No? Very good. We can end the session here. I would like to... Oh, there you go. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's very interesting what you presented. Did you try to to figure out a, a settlement of the houses? Settlement, you know, a settlement. Uh, not only the the house and the you know the how the infrastructure can play with it. But how to settle on on the, on the soil you know, in the in the territory in, the, in, a, in a settlement space? Because mm, I think the, the problem of the the house is not only related to the house in itself or to the infrastructure that arrives or that is included in the house. How they combine with each other? Uh, for what I know, but maybe I, I make a mistake, 
in, in this kind of slums, what is lacking is, is the, the idea of uh, dwelling space, because usually, if you, if you, if they have, if, if the people that build up the slums would be able to do what they want, they would start with the pressing, and then in this pressing to put a room that is a, a tiny house, and maybe to add another one, and maybe to add another one. But the center of the dwelling idea is to have a, a space in, in which Benny. So, uh, it is very important to the, the work that you did. I would, I would uh, ask, uh, did you think to, 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 to think in um, terms of possible settlement fabric? Uh, th this has an, an effect also onto the infrastructural system. Uh, that's it. This is a question. I'm sorry to have you running backwards and forwards. I okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'll slow down. It's the Australian in me. I'm used to hundred miles an hour. <laughs> okay. So, all right. I have thought about that, and that's why we want the system to be able to connect, right? Uh, so that's the first response. Um, and yes, I am aware, having spent a lot of time in the slums, that people build on top. Um, and that's why the shipping container idea could be the model that um, is, is the most useful in that regard, because people do use shipping containers already that they start stacking on top of one another. Um, but in terms of uh, them like a settlement and them all being connected in that way, that becomes a little more tricky in a slum-like condition. Um, and, you know, there's a general misperception about the slums all being on what's called informal land. My research over the last five years has shown that's one condition of the slums, meaning the government owns the land and people have just settled there. There are so many slums now that have cropped up because of rapid urbanisation. We all know that half the population is now living in cities. We are an urban species and we're con it's continuing to grow and most of that growth is going to be in the form of slums um, in the developing world. Um, and this is something that the UN reports have made very clear. Um, so that growth is actually happening a lot of the time on privately owned land. So my dear friend Kadiri in Dagareddy slum, who I've spent a lot of time with, um, Every single person that I have met in that slum pays money to a landlord who owns not just the shack, but the ground on which the shack exists. And the insecurity of tenure increases dramatically if that's the situation. Um, because the minute you can't pay, you're kicked out, right? Um, whereas, say, in Kibera, you have many people who don't own the land but they've been given rights to stay there and they own the shack itself, okay? So coming up with a system that, you know, creates a whole entire neighbourhood um, could be a little bit more um, logistically difficult given the second condition of private land ownership, right? So, for example, in that situation, you wouldn't be able to easily come in with the infrastructure container as a dwelling, as a house, but you could come in with it being a water and sanitation facility that serves an entire neighbourhood, right? Um, or you could come in as a, as a, as a community centre that has a toilet and shower at the end of it that people living in that little neighbourhood can utilise. One of the things that I've found, and it's, and I'll talk about this more tomorrow, and I reported on that at the end of my film, one of the most troubling things around the slum upgrading program at the moment, from what I've seen, is that 
people are being pushed out of their shacks as the upgrading takes place. So for example, in Kibera, when we bring the electricity power lines in and we upgrade the water services in a part of Kibera, the cost of renting there goes up. So all those people get forced out and a new slum springs up somewhere else. So there's an economic problem around the upgrading. So this system is trying to be flexible enough to recognise the myriad ways in which um, uh, inequity works within an already disadvantaged population. Um, and that's why we're thinking, them of, uh, thinking of them as singular units which have the capacity to be connected um, to deal with some of the patterning issues that you, you've pointed out. But it all depends on the context of the slum and they're all very, very different in that way. Thanks. Thank you, Evan. Hello, I'm uh, Faris Kulikaris from Inwe, by State of the University of Saloniki. Uh, I'd like to, to comment about the communication between the chairs. Uh, the UNESCO chairs emailing list, it's a very useful tool. We, we participate in this proposal and uh, through this mailing list and uh, this new uh, project and this new website was very new and very challenging but uh, I think there are chairs like Inweb that we have very good background in informatics and ICT set technologies and we can contribute in a more holistic uh, uh, organization of uh, a platform where open source tools can be used in order to facilitate communication and to have a, uh, an, an archive of the projects that the church has implemented. This is inspiration for new ideas, for new projects, and uh, I think a lot of church have this background that maybe we should come together and make a draft version of a, a flexible and tool, new tool of communication with, I don't know, Skype meetings, platforms, chat, a lot of tools, there are a lot of tools that facilitate the communication nowadays and can be a motive for new ideas and new projects. Thank you. I don't think there are other comments that I thought he was finished. <laughs> That's a quick comment, uh, Adrian, uh, a lot of great ideas. In your proposal, as I said, I didn't see the whole proposal. Uh, conceptually, it sounds great, but building an infrastructure around the slum where dwelling uh, needs a lot of uh, practical implications. Uh, I don't know whether the proposal has been funded or is in the process of being funded. Perhaps looking at the practical implication of making a treatment unit operations different walls, different sections, waterproofing them and maintaining them. The maintenance of this type of infrastructure takes a lot of efforts, especially when you don't have the, the, uh, the environment that could support it. So perhaps that, that is just a comment that perhaps that could be spent on. Not sure. Otherwise, coffee break discussion. <laughs> We, we were uh, communicating privately beforehand about this. No, no, seriously. Um, absolutely. And so that's why many of the partners in this are actually already uh, non-profit organisations working in the slums who are working with communities, who have already been working with communities, building projects together with those communities. Um, so this is not, uh, you know... I'm very suspicious of the modernist solution <laughs> where you come in and it's a tabula rasa and you, you plonk it in. No, it's working from the grassroots up. Um, so it's very much the result of spending time with communities, looking at where their skills are, what their, their hierarchy of needs and concerns are, the organisations that are embedded within those communities, 
um, and how they work best with those communities and on what basis there are success stories with them. Um, so one of the, the things that I'd just like to very quickly say, because I don't want to dominate the question time, um, and you can even ask me tomorrow in the Human Settlements presentation, is this the, the problem of economics, right? And, you know, going around and interviewing the women that are working some of the water and sanitation facilities, some of them are only earning one dollar a day. But for certain organisations, that's genderising development. I'm very suspicious of that, right? That's, if you're, if you're working from six in the morning till nine o'clock at night, seven days a week and you're earning one dollar a day, that's problematic. Um, but organisations like Kunkui Design Initiative are premised upon collective financial apparatuses where an entire community owns that water and sanitation facility, they manage it collectively, and what you find is the women that are working there are often, you know, working eight hour days, as they should be, and earning, you know, two dollars fifty a day for their work, which is a huge difference in the slum, yeah? But what that means is you've got community buy-in into the facility. So that question is definitely one that's at the forefront of the conception of this. And yes, you're absolutely right. You can't just come in and plonk in a technical solution. And the reasoning behind this project is to try to creatively start with the other side of the problem, what works for the community, and then from there try to develop this solution. Yeah. Thank you. One more question, and then we close. And then we continue discussing during the coffee break, if you will. <laughs> so we reconvene here. What time, Chiara? A che ora torniamo? 15 minutes. So we reconvene here at 4.30. Thank you.